Exodus 40, 34 to 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out, until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel, during all of their travels. It's a well-known experience amongst uh, ministers, people like myself and their families, um, who work in ordained ministry. Uh, congregations usually spend quite a bit of time uh, working on who to call, and then they extend a call to a minister wherever. And then it's up to the minister and his wife uh, to weigh up that call to see whether they uh, decline it or whether they accept it. In fact, um, my colleague in Perth, in the Perth Church, has accepted a call to New Zealand, to one of the churches in New Zealand. Remember, our Perth Church closed, and so he needed uh, a call, and he got a call from New Zealand, and he's now settling down over there in Christchurch. But there was a whole process that went through that, and a lot of weighing up. First of all, the congregation had to weigh up who would be the right person to call, and then the minister and his wife, uh, they had to weigh up whether the Lord was indeed calling them uh, to, to do that uh, work over there. And so, you know, a lot of prayer and I can tell you a lot of struggle would have gone in, into all of that. Wouldn't it be a lot simpler if uh, God simply sent an email and said, you should stay or you should go? Uh, you'd think that would be a lot, a lot easier for, for ministers to decide. But here's a question. Is it only ministers and, and their wives who need to weigh up the Lord's will in big decisions? Well, it's an interesting question because um, I've come across it uh, in various congregations, especially smaller ones, where fairly vital people um, get an offer of a big promotion with a lot of money um, and they think in terms purely of the material gains and the, the, the progress in the company. And don't think about what happens to a small congregation when a key person leaves. And I remember having a discussion about that with someone once and uh, put that idea to them that, you know, do you understand that being here in this congregation is also a call and that you need to weigh this up like a minister does a call? And the answer was a flat no. Didn't believe that that was the case. Okay. So we're going to look at this. This weighing up the Lord's will. Is it just something that ministers need to do when they, they uh, face a call? Or does it have something to do with living in the presence of God for all of us? Because if we, we all live in the presence of God and we all face decisions that need to be made, some really big and important, some even life-changing, others quite ordinary day to day. Um, if we all live in the presence of God, then how much should we all then be weighing up the will of the Lord and not just those in ordained ministry? So this series of sermons has been all about the fact that quite often we can leave the presence of God way back in the, in the background of our minds. And we've been exploring the richness of having God forefront in our minds, that we live with him every day, not just on a Sunday morning like we are now, but we're conscious of God's presence every moment, every day. And so we've been looking at how that should affect the way that we live. And, and today we're looking at how that should affect our decision making. And so as we take a look at uh, Israel in, in the past, in the, in the passages we've read today, we see that they had a special experience of every day being um, aware of the presence of God. When you take a look at Exodus 40, 34 to 35, we read, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting, because the cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So when this special tent had been built, 
that Moses had been given instructions to build. Remember, it was divided into two main parts. First part is where a lot of the sacrifices were done, or most of the sacrifices, but it was divided by a blue curtain. And beyond that was called the Holy of Holies. And in there was the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the cherubim, the wings touching at the top? The, the top of the box was called the mercy seat. And that's where God was said to, to sit and dispense his mercy to Israel. The high priest was allowed only once a year to go into that area. And then only after very special cleansing ceremonies. Okay? And there, on the Day of Atonement, he would offer up the sins for the whole of the nation. Okay? And, and then the God would de decree forgiveness for the whole of the nation. When that tabernacle was finished and its use as a place of God meeting with his people was about to begin, we read of this cloud coming down from heaven and settling on top of the tabernacle. So much so that the, the priests couldn't go in to do the service that was required. They had to wait. Okay? Israel visibly could see something of the presence of of God. Whenever that cloud was there, they knew God was present. In 2 Chronicles 5, 13 to 14, this is what we read with regard to the temple later on. Remember the temple became the permanent tabernacle. The, they had the tent tabernacle because they had to keep pulling it down and keep moving. But once Israel came to, to settle in Jerusalem as their capital, then the permanent feature was built, the temple. And that too was constructed in a similar, a similar way with those two main parts. Okay? Listen to what happened when it was finished. The trumpeters and singers joined in unison as with one voice to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals and other instruments, they raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good, his love endures forever. So you get this wonderful big celebration going on. Can you hear it? The trumpets blasting, the cymbals clashing, this fanfare of, 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 and praise and, and glory to God being sung by choirs. And then we read this, then. So all this is going on. And then we read, then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Israel lived with the presence of God visibly in the form of this cloud over the tabernacle and later the temple. I've had people tell me that they would have loved to have lived in Old Testament times or even New Testament times so that they could live and see the things that Israel saw, to, to be there and see Jesus performing his miracles, to sit down and listen to Jesus teach, or to, to go back further and to, to see the, the sea being parted and Israel walking through on dry ground, or at Sinai with the cloud on top. But is that really something we should crave? Is, is that something that would just make our life easier in terms of understanding the presence of God? It was very important for Israel in terms of this cloud. When you um, read in Exodus 13, it governed their movement. And this is what you and I might crave. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if we would have this cloud that tells us what to do? Listen to this from Exodus 13. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. They always had the cloud in front of them or they always had the fire, pillar of fire in front of them. It was always there. And when the, the pillar of fire or the cloud lifted, guess what? Israel knew they had to pick up their tents and they had to follow it. And when it stopped, guess what? Israel stopped and Israel encamped. That would make life so simple. Should I move or should I stay? 
well, see what the cloud does. What does the pillar of fire tell me? What's it doing? But you and I live in the day of Jesus and his reign. You know what it says in Hebrews about Jesus and comparing it to the former days? It says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. God spoke to his people in various ways. And one of those ways he spoke to his people was also in the cloud. He spoke to them in terms of his will, whether they should stay or whether they should go. But listen to this. But in these last days, that was before. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Bible tells us you and I have the richer experience. It actually says in Scripture that the prophets who wrote long ago longed to see the things you and I are now experiencing. They wrote of these days and how they longed to witness those days, but they didn't. So if we're longing for the things that were experienced by Israel in the past, the Lord says, you're longing for that which is less. You have that which is far better, that which the prophets longed to experience. You're here. You're it. You've got Jesus. There's nothing better than that. You've got the realization of, of what the Lord has promised. And so when we talk about living in the presence of God and living with the presence of God, we're talking about having a guide. We have the means by which to make really, really important decisions. In 2 Samuel 6 verse 2, we read this. Speaking of David. Now David was a wise man. David was king of Israel. And it says, He and all his men set out for Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty. Now listen to this. Who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. So David brings up the ark. Why? Because it is a symbol, first of all, of the presence of God. God sits between the cherubim, okay? So David wanted that close to him. He was living consciously with the presence of God in mind. Now, why was that so important and how did he use this for decision-making? Well, in 1 Samuel 23, 1 to 3, this is what we read. When David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Kayla and are looting the threshing floors, listen to this, he inquired of the Lord. He inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord answered him, Go, attack the Philistines and save Kayla. David had a practice of not doing anything in terms of fighting battles unless he inquired of God first. Lord, should we go? Will you deliver them into our hands? And if the Lord said, yes, they went. If the Lord said, no, they didn't. That's living in the presence of God. Just like uh, ministers who have to weigh up a call, should I stay, should I go? David was saying, do we go to battle or do we stay? He made it a practice of inquiring of the Lord. We read also in Judges 20, 26, 27. Then the Israelites, all the people went up to Bethel. Bethel, by the way, the actual name of that town is, is um, what's the name? The translation is house of God. Bethel, house of God. Okay. Then the Israelites, all the people went up to Bethel. And guess what? The Israelites inquired of God. They inquired of God. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant was there. See, they went there because that's where the Ark was found. And the Ark was the symbol of the presence of God. For the Israelites, for their king, living in the presence of God meant that they were um, very much in the forefront of their mind, understanding that they weren't in the world on their own. And when it came to decisions, especially big decisions, they could inquire, they could seek advice, they could seek instruction, and that's what they did. For Israel, it was 
so much imprinted that they didn't set off unless the presence of the Lord set off, that sometimes they stayed in the place for more than a year. Did you read that in Numbers 9.22? Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days, a month, or a year, the Israelites would remain in the camp. They were so guided by the presence of God that even if the cloud stayed there for a year, they would remain in camp. Only when the cloud lifted would they go. Well, Christmas is coming up. And we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And remember that name, Emmanuel. Remember what it means? God with us. What, what's God saying to us when we celebrate Christmas? What's the message of, of Christ leaving heaven and coming to earth as a babe for us and then eventually dying on the cross? He loves us. He cares for us. He is with us. He wants us to know this. God is with us. So how do we live with the presence of God? Like we said, the Israelites wouldn't leave the camp unless the, the uh, cloud uh, pillar took off and went away or whether the fiery pillar moved on. They wouldn't move unless it did. How much do we consider God and his will when we make decisions? What, what does it mean to live in the presence of God? Surely, in part, and that's what we want to focus, focus on in this sermon, certainly in part it means that he needs to be in the forefront of our minds when we are into our decision-making as to what to do. Maybe we're in a situation where we're deciding, do I leave Wongan Hills and go to Perth or do I stay? <laughs> How much of that sort of decision is purely just a physical one? How much of it is purely family related? How much of it is purely uh, financially related or even job related? If we were to face that question, what would living in the presence of God look like? Surely it would mean that as we weigh this up, like David, like Israel, living in the presence of God, one of the things surely that we would do, if not the first thing we would do, is we would inquire of the Lord. Lord, what would you have me do? You know, it can be very tempting if you're getting a big promotion and lots of money. But Lord, is that what you want for me to do? Or is there something more important that's got nothing to do with, with position and with, with monetary concerns? Is there something more important that you want me to do here? Am I better here serving you or elsewhere? So it's not just for ministers. It's something all of us need to do if indeed we're living in the presence and with the presence of God. That can have to do with education too. You know, the, uh, the government and opposition are talking more, more these days of something that used to be just ordinary in my day when I was growing up. In my day, um, if you were not um, inclined towards um, a professional job, um, then you simply uh, stopped school at year 10 and you went off to TAFE and you got ready for a trade. Um, only if you were looking to you know, become a lawyer or a doctor or something like that did you consider going to university. That all changed a while ago and everyone headed for university. Uh, interestingly, now we have a, um, uh, a tradie uh, de uh, deficiency, not enough tradesmen. That decision about do I stay at school and go on to year 12 and university or do I go for a trade? Living in the presence of God means our kids and our grandkids, when they get to that age and that point in their life, means also inquiring of the Lord. What is it that you want me to do in your kingdom? How do you want me to live for your glory in this world? Is it in a trade, university, and a professional life? Who knows? But it starts with inquiring of the 
Lord. This is what living with the presence of God means. He's there forefront in our minds and in our hearts. But there are other decisions that we need to make. How much debt do I go into? Now we can look at something in terms of a mortgage or if we're going into a business, also going into a lot of debt to set up the business. Do we just make those decisions? Or living in the presence of God, again, do we inquire of the Lord? Even little things we should do living in the presence of God. You know, I've had it so often that I've been driving along um, and in my ministry over the last 40 years, quite often I get this thought, I should go and visit so-and-so. Nobody has said anything to me. I haven't uh, been told anything. I haven't heard anything. And when I have followed that prompt, guess what I've discovered? That person was really in need and just so much could have done with the visit. I've learned that that's a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Quite often when I haven't followed the prompt and I've said, no, I'm too tired or, you know, for whatever reason I've gone home or gone elsewhere, I've learnt later that that person really could have done with the visit. Those, in that way too, we can live with the presence of God. When you feel that nudge, you know, should I write a card or should I make that telephone call or should I make that visit? Guess what? That too is living in the presence of God. It's, it's a matter of being mindful that God's there in our life, not just Sunday mornings, but Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us all the time. You might say, oh, well, Jesus isn't here anymore. He's only here three years, God with us, Emmanuel, and then he left. But remember what scripture said? Before Jesus departed, what did he say to his disciples? I will not leave you as orphans. I will send another comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he will be with you. And so what did we find at Pentecost? The Holy Spirit has come into us. Every single one of us is considered by God to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. And remember, what was the temple? It was the place where God's presence was manifest, where it was clearly seen. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. We, we are temples of the, of the Holy Spirit. He's made his, his dwelling place in us. And he wants us to live consciously with the understanding that he is present in our lives. God was with us not just those three years that Jesus was on earth, but he continues to be with us in remarkable ways. And so you and I aren't here on our own. God isn't up there and we're down here. But he's present with us. Yes, invisibly, but that doesn't alter the fact of the reality. He is with us. We, we sang that to begin with, didn't we? Be still, for the presence of the Lord is here. I wonder how many of us would be freaked out if we were to turn around the pew and then visibly see God. The Bible says, even though turning around and looking, we can't see him, the reality is he is here with us. I said earlier that our first sermon in the series was we are the most privileged people on earth. Well, we are. How many people this morning in Wongan Hills can say God is sitting here present with them? But we can. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. We are the most privileged people on earth. But we need to understand that privilege but we also need to understand that blessing. Like Israel, we need to live with the presence of God. When we're faced with decisions, we need to first of all think of what is it that God would want us to do? What is the decision God would want me to make? Whether it's a big one or whether it's a small one. Do I accept that nudge and go and visit that person or make that telephone call or write that card? We're coming up to Christmas. 
And we're going, to, we're going to celebrate Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, leaving heaven, coming to earth. But the danger is, come Boxing Day, we've left it behind. And we go on as though we're on our own again. Let's not do that. Let's celebrate God's presence with us, Emmanuel. But let's also live in his presence and with his presence on December the 26th and the 27th and all the other days of the year. God has promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So let us keep his presence in mind in all that we think, say and do and decide. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we give you thanks that we're able to be here in your presence this morning. Indeed, we can't see you, but the reality is you are here. And so, Lord, we, we are in awe that you would want to be here with us. We are uh, in awe of this privilege that you've bestowed on us, not because we are better than anybody else in this town, not because we are purer, not because we're holier, not because we are better behaved and have better values. But out of your great love for us, you have bestowed on us your mercy and your compassion. And through Christ, you have drawn us to yourself into a living relationship and called us your children. And so, Father, we pray as we head towards Christmas and this, this celebration of Emmanuel, help us, Lord, to to understand and live with the knowledge that you are present with us every day. And so as the Israelites and David did help us also to do, to continually make inquiry of you, to seek you out, Lord, and to know what you would have us do in all manner of circumstances, that we might be directed by your word and by your spirit, and that we might live for your glory. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.